Welcome to a talk on GPU side input. My name is Timothy Lattice and this is the Neo Kino Graphics Channel. Let's take a view of traditional input latency. On the top we have the CPU part of the frame. This would be the work to generate the command buffer. Typically you read input at the beginning and towards the end you're going to do your submit. In the next row we have the GPU frames. So for every corresponding CPU frame after the submit you have the execution for the frame on the GPU. In this example I've tightened up the gap between CPU and GPU pretty decently. And then on the third line we have the scan out. This is when you actually see the frame. If we're doing scan and hold I like to use the frame midpoint of scan out as the perceptual midpoint of the latency. And so if we look at between read input and the frame midpoint, if we tighten up the frame bounds, we're going to say be around two frames of effective latency. Here's an example of GPU side input latency. On the top row, we have the thread in the background pulling input and then writing the input into a buffer that the GPU can read. When the GPU wants to read input after it finishes its view independent work, it fetches that memory and therefore the latency is a lot less. You'll notice I'm still using the frame midpoint here for scan out. And you see maybe I'm approaching one frame of latency if I grab input in the mid frame of uh, where the GPU is generating the graphics. Note the view independent dependent split. The more framework that is done in the view independent side, the more latency one can remove from the pipeline. And the ultimate is to render fully view independent then latch the input, then compute the camera view late in the frame, and then reconstruct the view directly from the view independent rendering. So the way this works, asynchronous input IO is processed on the GPU at low latency. We have a separate high priority CPU threads, maybe one or more depending on what you're pulling like from keyboard, mouse, or whatever, processing input. And for example, game pads might be updating every four milliseconds, for example. The CPU writes the input packets into a GPU readable memory, and the GPU fetches input packet to read the latest input state. Here's an example, 64 byte, single CPU cache line input packet. In this case, I'm, this is what I'm using when I don't need the mouse. So on the top, I have a 32 bit hash, which I'll go through later, followed by a 32 bit hot reload, that counter is for when I re hot reload the shaders. The next 32 bits I'm using for an FPS fraction top and bottom. This way I have a high uh, precision FPS. Then I have a 64 key bit array. This is whether the key is pressed or not. Then I have a 64 bit CPU timestamp and that's a timestamp of when the input packet was made. And then I have 14 bytes for uh, gamepad zero then a 16-bit screen resolution X, and then another 14 bytes for gamepad 1, and a 16-bit screen resolution Y. And if you look in the gamepad data, I have the, everything's mostly FP16, and then towards the bottom I have a 16-bit uh, integer, I have a button bit mask for all the things that are, that are not uh, high precision. So in this prior example, this is just one. That's one I like to use. You could reconfigure it for different usage. You could use two cache lines, for instance. It has some wasted space. I mean, I could be, it could be expanded with other input like mouse. Um, also, there's no touch input in there because I just don't use it. Now, if you're going to add mouse input, I would suggest doing it in a way that you pre-integrate over time. So another, instead of putting the exact change in the mouse, mouse wheel into the packet. Do the, the mouse wheel change divided by the time, the time between uh, when you pulled last time. This can be sampled with packet loss and it still makes sense. In other words, you're not going to necessarily see all the packets that you're writing. So if you just put the absolute change instead of the change over time, then you're going to start losing now I use a two deep packet ring buffer. So the CPU is going to construct the latest input state in the cache line aligned and size packet. And then after that's finished, it's going to copy the fully constructed packet 
into the GPU readable memory. And this is to minimize the chance of a partial read by the GPU. The GPU later is going to read once per frame as late as possible when it wants the input. Now, this will be done with the scalar path. So basically, in my case, it's going to read both packets, since it's a 2D ring buffer, via the constant cache. And typically, this is going to be done with a multi D word read on AMD. Then the shader is going to validate that both packet hashes are good, and then it's going to choose the latest packet with a valid packet hash. And afterwards, it's going to write that into GPU VRAM for fast access in later dependent work on the GPU. So why the slight complexity? So in Vulkan, this relies on submit boundary implicit cache flush. Therefore, the kcache reads will miss on the GPU caches and then pull the latest two packets. This will be the last two packets that the CPU wrote. Note that CPU writes and GPU reads are not strictly atomic at this granularity, meaning the GPU might read a partially completed packet. So the hash validation detects that the packet is partially written, and therefore the shader can discard the packet. Afterwards, you note that the GPU writes a golden copy, so later processing has fast access. Now, if you want to late latch input two times per frame, what you do is you have two separate two deep ring buffers, and then you have the CPU write to both ring buffers via duplication. This way, the first latch you read from the first ring buffer, and the second time you latch on the GPU, read from the second ring. And this way, you don't have to do any mid-frame cache flush or any non-cache reads. All you have to do is read the, the k-cache lines once per frame, and you know they're not going to be in the cache. So the usage case for this is you can late latch early in the frame for regular input processing, and then you can latch later in the frame to, say, get for camera rotation, if you're doing something where you're, you're drawing in a in a way that, you know, is 360 degrees, for instance. And lastly, the packet hash, I do something very simple. I just XOR 16 32-bit uints together. I use a 5555555 as a startup value, basically so that both packets fail if none had ever been written. Because if it's all zero, the hash is going to fail. And then the other 15 values are the other or the last 15 uints in the packet. Obviously, I'm skipping the first hash uint. And that's all there is to it. This is a very simple method to get your input processing on the GPU. I'm not really going to cover moving a game logic to the GPU in this slide, but this is basically just to give you an idea of how to solve the, the problems of going across the bus. Anyway, I hope you learned something. Take care.